It's great to be here. I have to confess, though, I don't know anything at all about building bridges. I did see a program about it once, though. Riveting. <laughs> building bridges is, of course, a metaphor. And today, I'm going to talk about metaphor. But first, I want to show you something magical. This here is a thaumatrope. It was invented in the 19th century by a scientist called John Ayrton Paris to demonstrate the phenomenon of persistence of vision, where we continue to hold a vision in our minds even after we've stopped looking at it. So it works a bit like this. On one side, we have a cage. On the other side, we have a bird. And then, woohoo, spin it around like that. And it looks as if the bird is in the cage. It's magic. I looked at this and thought it was completely wonderful, but I also thought, yes, this is the perfect metaphor for a metaphor. You see, when we use metaphor, we speak of something as something which it is not. So on one side, we have the literal truth, and on the other side, a metaphorical fiction. Then we spin them together, and they blur, becoming combined in our minds. So to take an example, like on one side, you might have Brexit, which is a literal process. Um, <laughs> yes, first one to mention the B word. On the other side, you have divorce, which is a metaphorical fiction. And then you spin it round like that for long enough, and the two become imperceptibly combined in our minds. So now, whenever we speak about Brexit, we all feel sad, mournful. Well, some of us do, anyway. <laughs> Aristotle said that to be a master of metaphor was a sign of genius. And indeed, when you look back through history, you see that many of the greatest ideas have been communicated through metaphor, from Adam Smith and his invisible hands, to Churchill and his iron curtain, to James Watson and the building blocks of DNA. We use metaphor once every 16 words on average, so it's hard to speak for long without reaching for a metaphor. And metaphors are very loaded. Pew! Metaphors plant ideas deep in our subconscious, and it really does work like magic, because with metaphor, we can make anything into anything. You can make a product into a person. Alexa, can I have a metaphor, please? You can make a company into a family, and the whole world can become a village. But these images are not just poetic or prosaic. They are highly persuasive. Research shows that changing nothing more than the metaphor in a piece of text leads people to fundamentally different reactions on questions ranging from whether or not they'll invest in companies, support particular policies, and even back a foreign war. Even back a foreign war. So this, ladies and gentlemen, seems to me to be the essence of what we mean when we talk about spin. Today, I am going to shine a bright light on the dark art of spin, because metaphors can be used systematically and strategically, not just to lead, but to mislead, conjuring up powerful images that do go deep in our subconscious, and that can prove decisive and divisive on some of the biggest issues of our time. So how I'm going to do this, I'm going to go through the three biggest issues that have been all over the front pages of the papers this week. And they're all over this morning's front pages as well. I had a very early start. But don't worry, I've had a lot of coffee. <laughs> so first, of course, is Brexit. Deal or no deal? That is the question. Let, let me just ask for a show of hands, how many people here think that no deal would be a good thing? Oh, wow. <laughs> Hello, Oxford. <laughs> An excellent demographic we have here. Um, and I'm suspecting that as soon as I said no deal, an image appeared in your mind, and that image was probably something like a cliff, and there are rocks below, and there's a crash, and you'd have feelings of imminent disaster. Well, these images have not appeared in your mind by accident. They have been strategically spun for years now. 
For years, Brexit has been described as an act of self-harm or national suicide by such illustrious leaders as Tony Blair, Nick Clegg and the late Paddy Ashdown. More recently, as the prospect of no deal has become more, like, more likely, so that image has crystallised, becoming clearer in our minds. So recently, John Major said we were jumping off a cliff. Nicola Sturgeon has said we're being driven over a cliff, and Jeremy Corbyn has said it would be a disaster if we went crashing out without a deal. Look at the front page of this morning's Observer. You will see no deal is the story, and there is an image of a cliff next door with rocks below and the word suicide. I am not making this up. But not all of you will be Observer readers. <laughs> Some of you might think that no deal is a good thing. And for you, maybe, just maybe, the image you have in your mind is that no deal would represent a clean Brexit. This is the image that has been projected and promoted by the likes of The Telegraph, The Sun, and Jacob Rees-Mogg for a while. And this is very attractive, particularly if you perceive Brexit to be a mess at the moment, because what do we do when we're confronted with a mess? Well, we clean it up. <laughs> Incidentally, it's the same response if you think Theresa May's deal is a pile of poo, you know. <laughs> so you see both sides are spinning. Both have fictitious imagery, but it is, it is extraordinary the extent to which these fictitious images dominate debate. If you Google Brexit and clean, you get 36 million results. Google Brexit and cliff, you get 9 million results. Google Brexit, facts and figures, a measly 150,000. This is the thing. The metaphorical always beats the literal. It offers seductive simplicity in place of the inherent ambiguity of what is, as a matter of fact, unknown. Or as Churchill put it, it enables us to decide issues that have confounded our powers of reason by the standard of the nursery. Let's move on. Issue number two, tech the tech company's social media. There's been a whole heap of stories about this this week. You'll have all seen them, self-harm images on Instagram, fake news on Facebook, and there's a front page story today about children on Tinder. Nice. To regulate or not to regulate? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the second question. But what, pray ask, is the imagery here? Well, this is interesting because as technology has evolved, so too has the language and imagery about it. To start off with, of course, it was Tim Berners-Lee who came up with the idea of a World Wide Web back in 1989, when the imagery was precisely that, that of a web. Curiously, Berners-Lee's original proposal for funding called it the web a mesh, different word, same image, a kind of grid-like shape. The same image which is present in the idea of an internet. But then, governments around the world needed to decide how they were going to respond to this. It was Al Gore in 1993 who first coined the idea of an information superhighway. When I first became a government speechwriter 20 years ago, I was constantly writing speeches about the information superhighway. And of course, this was imagery that was fantastic because we all instinctively understand that highways need strict rules about who goes on there, where they go, what they do when they're on there. So th this was fantastic for governments who wanted to introduce regulation. However, rhetorically, it proved to be a bit of a dead end why? Because Silicon Valley did not want to be regulated. They wanted to be free to explore uncharted territories, to expand the frontiers of the human imagination, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Ladies and gentlemen, they gave to us cyberspace. We fire up our navigators, we launch our search engines, we click on hyperlinks. Sometimes we land on sites and sometimes they crash and only the intrepid would dare venture into the dark web. If someone comes up to you while you're tapping away, you may well jolt and, and say, oh God, sorry, I was in another world, you know. And we all get it, don't we? We all get that when we go online, we go up there, we, we transcend. What will we all do like, when we, we break for lunch? 
I don't know about you, but I'm going to put a few photos up on Facebook. Up on Facebook. Try saying to people you're putting a photo down on Facebook. They will look at you as if you're absolutely crazy. The video will be uploaded to YouTube, and maybe people will download it. The draft of my speech is stored on my cloud. <laughs> but it's all a myth. My data is not really kept in a fluffy white mass of condensation where no one can get near it. Rather, instead, it's kept in a huge data bank somewhere in Scandinavia where people can and do break in. <laughs> but the perception is cyberspace, and that's what matters because that's what governs how we think, feel, and act. And this, I think, explains why it is that when people go online, they will behave with no regard whatsoever to the normal rules and codes of conduct that will govern our behavior on Earth. They will behave as if they're in an alternate universe. I also think it explains why governments have found it so hard to get to grips with regulating the tech companies, because we perceive them as extraterrestrial, supranational, and supernatural omniscient and omnipotent, so instead of reining them in, instead we look up to them as masters of the universe. We even talk about them as tech gods, tech titans. They're not gods, they're geeks. Isn't it time we brought them back down to Earth? <laughs> Thank you. The third issue, assisted dying. And this is an issue which has been in the papers this week. There's been another high-profile case of someone going to the Dignitas Clinic in Switzerland. There's a big row in the Royal College of Physicians about whether or not they should come out in support of assisted dying. And I saw that just yesterday, Vince Cable, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, for those who don't know, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, has come out and said that he is in favor of assisted dying. He's changed his mind. So this is our third question, live or let die. It might seem surprising to you that an issue of the magnitude of life or death could be determined by twist of a metaphor. Paradoxically, the more emotionally fraught the matter we're dealing with, the more likely we are to seek refuge in a metaphor. It provides sanctuary, and sometimes the facts of a case are simply too hard to bear. Some of you may remember the case a few months ago of Alfie Evans, a young baby who was on a life support machine at Alderhey Hospital in Liverpool. There was a big row about how he should be treated. The family wanted Alfie kept alive. The hospital wanted his life support machine to be switched off. As is so often the case, these different per perspectives were then articulated through different metaphors. So to the family, Alfie was a fighter, a soldier, a warrior, a gladiator. They created a campaign group for him, and they called it Alfie's Army. The hospital had a different metaphor. They said that Alfie was in a semi-vegetative state. Both sides were spinning. Alfie was no more a gladiator than he was capable of photosynthesis or that he had roots. And I was particularly concerned about the use of the vegetative metaphor, given a previous study had shown that we attribute fewer of the qualities of life with someone in a vegetative state than we do to people who are dead. Yeah, we actually saw pitsy people in a vegetative state as more dead than dead people. So I wanted to test this. I had a researcher go out and ask 200 people whether they agreed that Alfie's life support machine should be switched off. The first 100, she told that Alfie had an undiagnosed degenerative neurological condition, which was the precise medical terminology used in that case. With those words, just 23% of people agreed his life support machine should be switched off. Then we introduced the metaphor. We were spinning, we knew we were, but we wanted to test the metaphor's power, and we were staggered. Doing nothing more than introducing that language led to a doubling in the number of people who thought his life support machine should be switched off. So it should be of intense concern to us that almost all of the press coverage about this case referred to Alfie as semi-vegetative. 
It should also concern us that in a 12,000 word judgment, just two sections were put in bold and italics by the judge for emphasis, one of which was this term, semi-vegetative. Equally, it should concern us that as assisted dying is becoming a political issue around the world, so the use of this term is increasing exponentially. Hansard shows just one reference to the term in the whole of the 19th century. 19 years into this century, there have already been 67 references. If we're talking about science, shouldn't we stick to science? Look, for all the talk about post-truth, fake news, alternative facts, many of the biggest lies around us today are told through metaphor. Look at the papers every day. You see the same images recurring. Benefit recipients are scum. Refugees are vermin. Women are vixens, cougars, or foxes. You see the same thing on social media, and increasingly it's there in political discourse as well. Let's not forget that the current inhabitant of the White House was elected on a ticket of drain the swamp, and he regularly speaks about immigrants as snakes, the same metaphor used by Hitler, African countries as shitholes, and women as bitches. And this matters. Research by Rutgers University shows that people who instinctively associate women with animals are more likely to sexually harass women and less likely to be sympathetic to victims of rape. Let's call this out. The best way to preserve our humanity is to assert our humanity. There are no vermin amongst us, no scum amongst us, no bitches amongst us. We are all human. Likewise, with Brexit, there's not really a cliff ahead. There's not really an imminent suicide. And I certainly can't see Jacob Rees-Mogg sweeping in with a broom in one hand and a feather duster in the other to ensure that Brexit is clean. He'd send his maid in. <laughs> in my first TEDx talk, I called for rhetoric to be restored to the curriculum. This is vital so that everyone understands how to lead. Now, I believe it's more important that we all understand how words can mislead, so that we get better at differentiating between fact and fiction, truth and lies, the metaphorical and the literal. In short, we need to open people's eyes to spin, and if we do, our communities, our democracy, and our society will win. That's how we'll really build bridges, and it doesn't require a single rivet. Thank you very much.